I think we'll go ahead and get started. I wanna welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us for the fifth annual Girls Education Conference. My name is Denise Jorgens and I'm the director of International House here at the University of Chicago. International House has been a co-sponsor of the Girls Education Conference since the beginning. This past academic year, International House of Chicago celebrated an important milestone, our 90th anniversary. International House of Chicago was founded by John D. Rockefeller Jr. in 1932. From the day International House opened its doors, our mission has been to promote cross-cultural understanding, mutual respect, and friendship among students and scholars and on the part of the people of metropolitan Chicago and the broader communities that we serve. Through the International House Student Life Experience and our internationally focused public programs, such as today's conference, International House is dedicated to transforming people's lives for a better world. This mission is then further extended through the work of our International Houses Worldwide Organization, which is currently a network of 15 houses on four continents. We invite you to join us here uh, on campus uh, or for many of our online uh, gatherings during the coming academic year as we continue uh, uh, our Global Voices Performing Arts and Lecture Series programs. Information about all of our internationally focused public programs is available on our website. Today, we are really thrilled to host uh, the, this program focused on the important topic of the future of girls' education in a world of AI. On behalf of the global International House community, I wanna welcome you again and thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to introduce Amanda Sosola, Senior Vice President for the African Community Fund for Education. Amanda? Thank you, Denise. Um, hi everyone, I am Amanda Sosola. I'm the Senior Vice President of the African Community Fund for Education. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I was brought up to believe that education is the key to success and that investing in education is one of the greatest things you can ever do for yourself because it gives you options in life. But what happens when that means is taken away from you or circumstances don't allow you to pursue an education? This is where the core purpose of our organization lies in. Our mission is to minimize the impact of poverty by creating empowerment opportunities for disadvantaged children. Um, we firmly believe that education is a powerful tool that can break the shackles of poverty and pave the way for a brighter future. In pursuit of our mission, one of our key areas that we focus on is providing assistance with tuition for high school girls and women in rural areas. We understand the challenges faced by these individuals whether it be financial constraints or barriers imposed by early marriages and pregnancies. It is our responsibility to bridge the gap and to ensure that every girl, regardless of their circumstances, has a quality education. Um, today, I want to highlight the importance of aligning our efforts with the sustainable development goals set forth by the United Nations. Um, these goals provide a comprehensive framework for global development, and we are proud to partner with the following SDGs. Uh, the first one being SDG 4, which represents quality education. 
Our aim is to ensure that all girls and boys have the opportunity to complete free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education. Education is not a privilege. It is a fundamental right that we should be accessible, that should be accessible to every child. Um, the second SDG that we partner with is SDG 5, which is for gender equality. We strive to eliminate all discriminatory laws, practices, and customs that hinder girls and women from accessing education. Furthermore, we advocate for equal opportunities for leadership in all levels of education, empowering women to take charge of their futures. Lastly, the last SDG is SDG 10, which is for reduced inequalities. Our goal is to promote the social, economic, and political inclusion of all individuals. We work to ensure equal opportunities for all and eliminate discriminatory practices that perpetuate inequalities. I would like to take a moment to express our heartfelt gratitude to our partners from the University of Chicago, the YWCA, for their unwavering support. Their collaboration and shared vision have been instrumental in driving our mission forward. Looking ahead, we are excited about the future and possibilities it holds. Our next step is to provide more access to technology and artificial intelligence to girls and women in education. We recognize the ever evolving nature of our world and it is essential for us to equip them with the necessary skills to thrive in a digital era. In conclusion, I want to reiterate our commitment to creating empowerment opportunities for disadvantaged children in marginalized communities. Together, we can make a lasting impact and contribute to a more equitable, prosperous world. Let us join hands and work towards a future where every child, regardless of their circumstances, has the chance to fulfill their potential and achieve their dreams. Thank you very much. I am looking forward to the panel discussion on the future of girls' education in AI. It's a very interesting topic and I cannot wait. Thank you. I think now we will see the, um, the video. My name is Ndagasva Morauba. I am one of the beneficiaries of ACFE program in Zimbabwe. I am so happy that I passed my O levels. And I hope to move on and get a job for my children and to look after my family and my children. I am a married woman with three kids. Without school, life was not easy for me. Uh, I worked so hard to feed my children and look after the family, but the life was not easy without school. In Zimbabwe, life without school is not easy. So I trying to make ends meet, and I told you from morning to if trying to make ends meet, but life was not easy. Luckily and lastly, I find a help from the ACFE, which gives me scholarship, stationery, books, and uniforms that he gave me. A, hope for the future and I passed my own levels. Feeding program was so important for us as we come very far with the empty stomachs to school. Stationery and the school shoes and the uniforms was so very important because it gives us confidence and the shoes are so important as we come very far. We walk long distances. Now that I have passed my own levels, I wish to go to Polytechnic College and do electrical engineering and got a professional job and earn a living and look after my children and my family.
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Buita, and I'm the founder and CEO of an organization called Girl Security. I'm also a Chicagoan, and so I want to thank the International House and the African Community Education Fund for including us in this important conversation and also uh, for your important work. Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker who is not only uh, inspiring generations of girls in girl security, um, is really one of the most well-respected um, and herself empowering uh, leaders in the artificial intelligence space. Uh, and so I feel very fortunate to be able to introduce Merve, who is the research director at the Center for AI and Digital Policy. The center educates AI policy practitioners and advocates across 60, over 60 countries and leads a research group which advises international organizations such as the European Commission, UNESCO, the Council of Europe, and others on AI policy and regulatory developments. Merve is also founder of AIethicist.org, which I will pop in the chat for everyone, and a data ethics lecture at the University of Michigan. She is a researcher, trainer, and consultant working on AI policy, governance, and regulation. She provides consultancy and training services to private and public organizations on responsible AI, ethical and responsible development, use and governance of AI as well. Merve also works with several nonprofit organizations globally to, both, to advance both the academic and professional research in this field for underrepresented people. She has been widely recognized by a number of organizations, most recently as one of the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics, and as a runner up for Responsible AI Leader of the Year in 2022. We're delighted to have you with us, Mirve, to sort of set the stage for what will be a timely and important conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lauren. Always amazing to share the stage with you. Uh, and thank you for introducing me to this conference and allowing me the chance to present here as well. Uh, when I was asked to do the keynote uh, for this uh, today's event, my first reaction was uh, to solely focus on AI and education and what that means for our educational system and the current issues of representation in the tech force, et cetera. However, I also reflected on the fact that a lot of my recent conversations have been about referring what AI is and AI is not, and what its capabilities are. Um, so I decided to focus on that subject uh, instead of provide, and instead provide some fundamentals from which uh, I know you and the amazing panelists, set of panelists will move the conversation forward uh, so let me share my slides very quickly and start um, with that discussion and happy to uh, answer questions at the end as well. One second. All right, so for many years, uh, this has been my opening slide in, in many conversations and uh, I will not break the tradition here today. So. Uh, Let's start with, I will start with what AI systems are and are not, and then also move to the generative AI and some of the harms that they might generate, and as well as the limitations. Uh, the popular media, uh, the stock image libraries that some of us use, or the claims of many AI investors and those who are benefiting from AI, have not really helped our understanding of what AI systems are, really are. So we're not talking about uh, the likes of Terminator or um, conscious robots who are trying to take over the world and, and, and humanity. We are not talking about uh, white shiny robots who have to look at a screen and wear uh, headphones to uh, for customer services or call centers. You already know that you are inter in interacting with uh, text to speech or uh, chat uh, applications, the software, the, the actual software systems when you call um, call centers, for example, and that your your voice is being recorded, that there is another uh, software system in the background who is trying to analyze 
the words that you say, the text and the words that you say, and try to provide an automatic answer. AI is not an entity, a physical entity that is sitting and thinking through uh, what to do next in, in, uh, in the world. It certainly is not a, a doctor or a nurse uh, with genderized, racialized, and sexualized images. We are really talking about, when we say AI systems, we are really talking about those systems that we are that are already uh, in our lives day to day. I would suggest that all of us are, um, are subject to AI systems, dozens of AI systems, intentional or unintentionally throughout our, our day. So you're already, in, if you have a smartphone and if you're using social media, if you're buying anything online, if you are using uh, a number of apps on your phone or your tablets, your laptops, if you're doing web searching, reading news online, etc., you are already using a number of AI systems that provide recommendations and do content, content moderation, content recommendations, etc. Uh, but AI also makes decisions, important decisions uh, in our lives. So when we now see uh, in many health uh, systems, hospitals, uh, as well as um, online health systems, AI making health diagnostics and recommendations, sometimes with, sometimes without a doctor's or a nurse's um, involvement. We see AI systems being used by uh, employers for recruitment purposes when you're interacting with these systems uh, to do your interviews or when they're reviewing the resumes and the CVs ahead of any human uh, recruiter. When you apply for credit, for mortgage, for other uh, loans, uh, it is the AI systems now who are making the initial judgment about your credit risk scores, as well as whether you should be uh, allocated a credit or a mortgage or at, at what interest rate those should be. When you apply to uh, rent a house uh, and there are dozens of tenant screening algorithms used by landlords or um, property management companies. Similar things, just like credit or uh, mortgages, AI is used for insurance premiums, whether you should get an insurance or not, and at what rate and at what premium. Uh, you use AI systems every time, uh, pretty much every time you're using, you're buying something online, uh, you're interacting with the consumer services, chat services, uh, and sometimes dynamic pricing on the um, internet, internet platforms that you're buying things from. AI is used to help with college admissions, scholarship admissions, um, as well as more uh, fundamental and uh, more human rights impacting domains such as policing, criminal justice systems, immigration control, court and prison decisions uh, that, that would be whether you should be uh, granted bail, what should be the conditions of your bail, how long a, a prison sentence you should uh, receive, whether you should be granted visa or uh, asylum status or refugee status, et cetera, or uh, even for local police uh, systems or police uh, law enforcement to try to predict uh, whether uh, you will be likely to commit a crime. Um, so AI is here, it is already making important decisions. Uh, but what we are seeing now is AI being considered as this all-knowing, all-seeing uh, entity, independent entity that independently thinks, reasons, feels, knows, and understands stuff. Uh, I wanna break that notion uh, if anyone in the audience is thinking that way, uh, this, like I said, is a recurring conversation for me. What AI does is, if you think of AI as a software, uh, an advanced software, it functions. It does not think, it does not feel, it does not reason. It functions just as a software functions. It analyzes correlations and patterns in the given data set and 
usually amplifies the most frequent uh, set of qualities in, in that data set. So if we um, go step by step, what an AI system or an algorithm is, you define an objective. Here is a problem that I want to uh, I, I want to solve, or here is the objective that I want to get. Let's say uh, find me the resumes that uh, that are most ap applicable or aligned with the job description that I that I have. So uh, scan all the resumes that uh, that we received. Um, a, a training data is necessary before we can put any AI into AI system into use. We need to train this, uh, the algorithm, the AI system. And what is necessary for that is a, a big set of a large data set uh, and uh, kind of provide some in, 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 um, reference points um, for the algorithm. And then we make a lot of decisions, whether it's about the model, whether it's about the data, whether it's about the objective uh, or problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, a lot of human decisions go into this and for better or worse, it also includes our unconscious biases or sometimes more political uh, or economic or social uh, priorities that we have. So we build these models, uh, we validate them and then we, use, we put them into use. Again, that might be uh, insurance uh, algorithms. It might be news recommenders. It might be your Spotify algorithm uh, that recommends the next, next song, et cetera. So once it's in place, what's, once it's in the wild, it's being used by people, uh, you get a lot of data flowing into this algorithm. And by date, not when I say data flowing into the algorithm, those are the interactions uh, that we have when we're using these algorithms. Uh, so the clicks that you have, the content you provide, or if it's like sensors that you might have around your house, around your workplace, is the data that is collected uh, by those sensors. And what happens is that the model uh, now trained for a certain function, for a certain objective, uses that incoming data to make uh, predictions, classifications, to recognize faces, to detect voices, et cetera. And it does uh, pattern analysis, whatever, depending on what kind of a function that you're using the system for. Uh, so at very high level, uh, you know, this would be the, 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 the again, very, very high level, the architecture or the, the rationale behind AI systems. But what we tend to forget, uh, or some of the developers tend to forget or tend to ignore at some point is uh, some of the uh, fundamentals, uh, foundational concepts. So, a lot of the time, AI predictions, AI classifications, et cetera, is um, taught as causation, A cause B. Uh, however, AI systems really look for patterns. They are bound by the data sets. So they're looking at patterns and correlations within the data set that they're given and applying it to the new data. They are not providing us with uh, causal relationships. Um, there is also uh, a tendency in AI development to consider, for example, gender as a binary concept, whereas we know that there is a, a, a spectrum. There is a tendency to uh, use concept of race as a biological concept, which it's not, it's a social construct. So trying to use uh, facial images, biometric uh, data, some of our, uh, some of other interactions to, for example, predict race or um, uh, racial features. There is a tendency to use anatomy to make um, predictions uh, or categorizations about personality, looking at your face just like, uh, uh, in, in history with the examples of phrenology, physiognomy of eugenics, uh, looking at your 
facial features, your body features, and trying to predict whether you're a criminal, whether you're credit worthy, whether you're employable, whether you're trustworthy, etc. There's also uh, a tendency to consider uh, disability as an inability. A lot of the AI systems do not respect the diversity of abilities, uh, whether physical or neurological. Uh, disabilities are usually considered as not being able to do uh, anything. And when we look at AI systems as software based on statistical uh, analysis, what this means as this means is those who do not represent um, uh, the typical abilities are usually considered uh, edge cases, outliers, or errors in the systems. And when that happens, uh, we uh, see a lot of AI systems, uh, either by intentional design or unintentional uh, design and bias issues in the data sets uh, and this consideration of outliers and errors. We see a lot of AI systems not uh, performing the way that they should perform, such as Racial, uh, yeah, racial bias in medical algorithms, which favors white patients over uh, sicker black patients. This was a uh, case of um, op uh, optimal algorithm used in a healthcare uh, system. We see autonomous cars uh, or autonomous vehicles hitting cyclists or people with uh, mobility devices cause there was not enough uh, Data state, there was not enough examples of the, um, either bicycles or different uh, uh, mobility devices in the data set. So the, the, the autonomous vehicles do not recognize this as, um, as objects to, uh, to, to avoid or moving objects. You know. uh, we see uh, you know, credit card companies uh, providing discriminating against women, even when they have the exact same amount of assets and uh, asset backgrounds, uh, providing them with lower credit lines or higher interest rates for the credit that they're receiving. Uh, we see, I mentioned um, tenant scoring uh, or tenant screening algorithms, where uh, algorithms are making decisions about creating this uh, you know shut up credit score uh, and we could discuss whether credit score itself is a uh, is a good indicator or a good system but setting that aside also a lot of unregulated tenants tenant screening companies um, pushing people either out of housing or preventing them uh, um, getting housing or we see uh, credit scoring algorithms or credit uh, mortgage approval algorithms having significant uh, differences in the way that they uh, analyze and provide approved credit to people of different uh, backgrounds. So when we look at this, you might say this is one of uh, 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 incidents and it might be improved by you know, better data sets, better design decisions, et cetera. What we tend to miss is it is usually the same uh, historically marginalized or disadvantaged communities that keep being subject to these harms, as well as being unrepresented in the data sets, as well as being uh, having this cumulative effect of um, cumulative harms at the end of the day. Similarly with facial recognition, uh, you know, causing uh, misidentification and, and causing uh, in facial recognition systems used by police, causing wrongful arrests, or um, facial recognition systems again not uh, working to the same degree, same uh, level of accuracy and performance for everyone uh, flagging uh, students. Um, uh, students of color or ethnic uh, minorities as uh, errors in, 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 in the systems causing a lot of angst and stress to um, when they're taking exams, for example, uh, online exams. 
So coming back to what I wanted to cover, like why is this happening with AI systems? What are the limitations of the systems? AI systems are limited to their data sets. If the system does not have enough data, representative data, representative of, of everyone um, in, the, in the population that the system is going to be used, uh, representative of the qualities uh, of the population that is going to use, it is not going to create this, uh, you know, brand new prediction or brand new, brand new uh, idea. It is literally limited to, uh, it's just making up stuff and, like I said, finding trends and try to, trying to predict the next thing, depending on what, I, what it sees in its data set. It does not understand nuance. So when a tiny year old boy, for example, a child asked Amazon Alexa, said, what would be a nice fun challenge to do at home to pass time? Alexa told the child to um, touch a penny to an exposed plug circuit. Luckily with the parents being there, uh, that was a uh, avoided uh, disaster. But it doesn't understand the context of what happens if you touch a penny to an exposed plug circuit. Does the uh, user, uh, is the user old enough or knowledgeable enough, etc. It's just providing, some, here is a number of challenges, smart or stupid, uh, that I see in my data set that people shared in the forums uh, or in, in social media conversations or posts. Um, hey, this is a fun, fun uh, challenge. Similarly, uh, like I mentioned, these systems, AI systems, might not be accurate 100% uh, of the time, or at, at times there are significant accuracy or performance uh, differences uh, when it comes to uh, the AI system uh, used on different populations. And again, that tends to be. Uh, because a lot of the times the data sets, uh, whether it's object, object recognitions like image recognition or facial data sets or text or language uh, or anything that uh, anything else that you might be uh, thinking of, a lot of the time majority is represented in those data sets. And uh, a lot of the times it is again, the majority that is represented in the developers, AI developers, and um, the, this technology developers who might not understand or who might not even question the uh, the embedded decisions or unconscious biases or in the systems. We are also dealing with a lot of the time with black box uh, uh, algorithms and AI systems where the system does provides an outcome, uh, it provides predictions, classifications, but uh, the developers don't necessarily understand uh, uh, why the system is behaving that way. Uh, a, a, a very known example of this, for example, was this uh, uh, classification algorithm working perfectly, almost 100% accuracy, uh, but when they started trying to, you know, figure out why the system was um, working uh, for huskies and not necessarily, for example, other animals. Uh, they figured out that the picture in uh, that was classifying the husky was actually uh, classifying the snow, not the animal. So almost all the pictures uh, related to huskies had snow in the background. So it wasn't necessarily a good classifier for a husky, but it was a really good classifier for, uh, for snow. So we don't necessarily, you might say that the system is uh, working perfectly or very accurately, uh, but it might not actually be doing the uh, work that you think it does. It also encodes the biases and the values of its developers. Again, like I said, intentionally or unintentionally. And with that, it can deepen the injustices and imbalances. For example, if you have red lining data, uh, housing data that is embedded in your historical data set, the system is going to provide more 
uh, recommendations or decisions that will enforce some of those historical or structural issues. Similarly, if New York, if the data set represented uh, male employees, uh, for example, uh, there will be more predictions or recommendations for, uh, to hire male employees over uh, others, for example. Or if the algorithm, a health algorithm was uh, built on, for example, more on uh, white or lighter fair skin data, it might have uh, issues with uh, predicting or recognizing, detecting uh, other dermatological issues for people who do not have uh, uh, light skin. I already mentioned that it doesn't understand context the way that humans do. So things that humans would uh, immediately uh, understand, see, connect, AI systems may not be uh, able to do that and make very, very stupid mistakes to that effect. And they also have a, a, a cybersecurity vulnerability that they can be, uh, their outcomes, their decisions can be altered with, um, with, with hacking attacks that are incredibly, incredibly uh, hard to, um, to detect or to monitor. And what that means is uh, we are dealing with, uh, despite all the possibilities and promises of AI systems, and there are many, we are also dealing with denial of services and opportunities for many people, uh, some services or products not working to the same extent that they would work for uh, the majority uh, of the population. We are trying, we are spending extra time and extra labor to make a system work for us, uh, for our accent, uh, to make it, make the system understand our accent, for example, uh, or and in worst cases that we are incurring, incurring psychological, financial, physical harms, as well as misrepresentation, underrepresentation and marginalization. So those are all in the uh, existing AI systems um, that we have been talking about, uh, as, as Lauren mentioned in the introduction, that we in the AI ethics, AI governance, space have been talking about for years now and still fighting this issue. Uh, but more recently, uh, uh, we also had, it, had, it, had a, another layer of uh, AI systems, generative AI systems that some of you might be uh, more familiar with uh, and have interacted recently. So I've got a couple of slides that I'm gonna quickly uh, mention. What is generative AI? At the very essence, at the very simplest description, it is picking the next word based on probabilities in a very, very large data set. So when you're interacting, for example, with the likes of ChatGPT or similar uh, chat systems, it is uh, trying to predict the next word and looking at its large data set, looking at past users and trying to predict the next word and making some uh, uh, decisions on whether always to use uh, the, the most probable world or sometimes add some randomness uh, uh, to its answers that uh, you might have also experienced. But at the end of the day, what it is doing is um, that it has limitations, like the more of the, the lengthier the, the conversations that you have, for example, that it's going to forget what you discussed at the very beginning. You might be correcting this answers multiple times. It will still say two plus two is equals five after a period of time. Uh, and it is uh, very much a, uh, a system that is based on probabilities. It says things that sound right based on things that sounded like uh, in its training material. It, and it's very confident uh, you know, it might be wrong most of the time, but it's very confident in it uh, about its uh, abilities. And it is the same uh, with uh, generative AI systems that also use, for example, images or voices, etc. Uh, this was a, 
uh, petapixel project that looked at as generative AI system to kind of come up with pictures uh, of uh, different, you know, uh, higher education or edu education uh, um, departments, you will notice that a lot of the uh, science engineering uh, and uh, sciences such as physics, uh, chemistry, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, biology, etc., cetera, are uh, very much uh, overwhelmed by white male, uh, what I call male whale and uh, male pale and yale. Uh, and then the more social sciences or soft sciences, uh, and we can go into another conversation around that, are occupied by uh, at, by female uh, and very uh, females that look very much alike. So you're also see, already seeing how the system is uh, encouraging and amplifying the biases, the social biases and political biases that we have in the society, but amplifying this in, in, in that sense. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too, too much detail on, on these, but uh, again, going into uh, whether it's chat systems or image generator systems, generative AI systems, we are seeing more and more examples of uh, amplification and deepening of the existing biases. Whereas, for example, you ask for a terrorist a photograph of a terrorist, is going to it provides you with uh, a lot of uh, similar faces. Uh, that I'm not going to go into detail or uh, similarly when you ask for like a drug dealer uh, there is a lot of gender and racial stereotyping here as well as well as a re religion uh, religious uh, stereotyping so we have uh, opened a complaint or submitted a complaint to FTC for uh, to investigate open AI and making sure that they uh, meet this uh, some of the responsible AI uh, governance uh, and and obligations before they roll they roll these systems out to uh, to the society kind of unleash them onto the society. So we continue our campaign uh, trying to pressure FTC to open that investigation. Uh, so uh, any help is appreciated. But uh, as a last uh, shout out, uh, I do want to uh, mention some of my favorite people and some of the leading scholars that if you're interested in this field of AI and you know how, how AI actually works, demystifying AI systems, as well as what are some of the implications on society and communities, uh, would uh, a huge shout out to the uh, leading scholars like Dr. Choi Palomini, Temnit Gebru, Dr. Temnit Gebru, uh, Dr. Birani, and Virginia Eubanks, Dr. Hanna, uh, Dr. Benjamin, Roha Benjamin, or Emily Bender and Margaret Mitchell, amazing scholars doing amazing work in this field. And um, you might be following them on Twitter, get their books, watch them on YouTube. Uh, like I said, huge shout, shout out. Uh, and, I'll stop there and uh, see if you have any questions and happy to answer. Thank you so much, Merve. That was also, I think, important. Um, I appreciated that you're framing the conversation with a lot of these sort of overarching issues, because I feel as though what we saw in the last few weeks with respect to the conversation around generative AI was just this overwhelming sense of what are we actually talking about? And so I think this was a really helpful way to introduce the conversation because um, I think there's a lot of lack of information, not only for girls and women and not only around the global majority and, up and throughout the entire world, but also I think just everyday people lacking a baseline understanding of what we're actually talking about. So I'd love to open it up to participants or even other panelists with questions um, for Mirve on either what she presented on or anything else in the space that I'm sure she can also answer. And feel free to um, just put it in the chat if, if that's easiest. While folks are thinking, Mirve, I had a question for you. Um, 
having just been with uh, lots of folks who are thinking about this issue more from the trust and safety side of things, was just a UN statistic around two thirds of school aged children in the world lack access to the internet. And what I wondered from your vantage point is, to what extent do you think the AI community is diagnosing the lack of access versus those who have access to AI? What are some of the conversations you're hearing about what this will, how this will impact already deep systemic global inequality um, around the world? What are sort of the narratives that are being shaped and maybe even touch on some of the solutions or ideas that people have already implemented? And I think actually Julian will be able to talk a little bit about this as well. But I just wondered sort of what's the air of that conversation right now? That's a very deep question. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the conversations on AI and who is not represented in the systems and who do not have access to the systems tend to focus on a couple of things. One is data collection and immediate uh, response from many in the AI community or AI developers is how do we get, can collect data on these communities? Uh, so we have more data, we have more representative data not questioning what that means for the community is, not questioning the exploitative uh, nature of data collection in general, and whether that collection of data is ultimately going to uh, help that community or get them to be marginalized further. For example, if you are collecting face images uh, to make your facial recognition system uh, more accurate across different uh, regions of the world, across different communities and ethnicities. Does that mean that you know, they are all going to equally, equally positively and equitably going to benefit from uh, those bigger data sets? Or is that going to be used by law enforcement and border control, et cetera, to uh, impose more advanced systems, uh, more surveillance systems? So the initial gut reaction or knee-jerk reaction from the community is how, do, how can we get into AI developers is how can we get into these communities, collect more data, improve our systems without a consideration of the communities. Uh, the other piece is um, what does this mean for the existing, like, are these systems widening the, the digital divide and the, the digital gap, or are they actually helping to narrow that? And if we have, when we have, for example, chat systems only working or working better in English, and not in a uh, local language, what does that mean for not only the, the small community, but the country uh, and their ability to benefit or use the systems in a way that works for them. Uh, so there was a interesting observation a few months ago when ChatGPT first came out saying that it's not necessarily the engineering skills uh, that will be necessary with this generative AI systems. It is going to be your English proficiency, sophistication of your English to be able to create you know, prompts, generative AI prompts uh, to make the systems do different tasks. So for example, if you're not speaking English or if you're not able to speak or create prompts uh, in you know, complex ways, can you actually benefit from the systems uh, where there, there might be benefits? These are not easy issues. Um, you didn't ask an easy question. <laughs> no, I know I didn't. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that there is an easy question, honestly. I can't think of one. Um, and I guess before we uh, break for the next video, um, from your personal perspective, I don't want to ask what is the level of frustration around watching this sort of take hold of people's 
imaginations today when these are issues that you've been working on for a very long time. But do you see an opportunity for change or for progress amid this heightened emphasis on AI? I mean, we've seen developers of ChatGPT and other technologies say, okay, now that now that we've opened Pandora's box, let's try to close it back up and and try to develop equitable solutions. Is there is there an opportunity or a window for for sort of progress or reflection or inflection right now? I think there's a lot of opportunity for progress from uh, um, you know, having more people in the conversation, cause for better or worse. I don't agree with the way that it was rolled out. These systems were rolled out. However, it did end up um, having more people uh, in the in It just made things more mainstream because people were able to play with ChatGPT or Dolly or Crayon or you know, uh, Mid Journey, whatever it is. Uh, and it just included more people in the conversation. Uh, and also it got attention of policymakers, lawmakers as well. So we are constantly on a daily basis, you know, responding and reacting to lawmakers in both US and uh, other parts of the world right now. Um, However, I am frustrated with the AI developers and AI investors who know better uh, and yet fueling some of the um, conversations or some of the rhetoric about the capabilities of, uh, of these AI systems or regenerative AI systems uh, with a singular focus or priority focus on, on getting more investments and getting more uh, profit out of it and not thinking about the human rights, rule of law, democracy, uh, what our democracy is going to look like uh, in the coming days. What does it mean for uh, you know national security? What does it mean for equity, social justice, et cetera, across all of these industries that I mentioned? So they know better. The mainstream uh, users are interacting uh, just now interesting. So I, I totally understand the excitement and there should be excitement. So there are some interesting stuff. However, uh, the developers and investors know better um, and that is not currently reflected in their rhetoric. Thank you so much, Mervé. We really appreciate you joining and providing, I think what was more than just a keynote, it was really a, a uh, a learning session and I really appreciate that and we're looking forward we're going to jump right into the next panel and I did share your website but if there are other resources Merve you feel folks might know about we can pop those in the chat as well um, so thank you so much for joining us thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity and I would say feel free to connect uh, on LinkedIn as well we provide a lot of uh, uh, resources on LinkedIn on a regular basis. So my website, AIethicist.org is, is a huge repository, but on an ongoing basis, uh, we share a lot of stuff on LinkedIn as well. Thank you. I will be sharing out some of your resources as well, especially the recent one on the generative AI capturing, uh, you know, the different uh, personas or people. Uh, really fascinating. Thank you so much. Well, I'd love for all the other panelists to join in as well, and I'll do introductions, and then we can have a conversation that will focus a bit more pointedly on girls and women's education, but also I think there's a conversation just to be had about um, equity amid this sort of push around artificial intelligence. So I'll just start by introducing our panelists first and then kick off with a question. So Julian Kajeri is a technologist and entrepreneur. Uh, he has experience leading software implementations and blockchain projects across the globe and regularly speaks at technology conferences on building inclusive solutions in blockchain for emerging markets. His ambition is to use technology to advance society at scale and a testament to this, he was one of 20 worldwide winners of the Schmidt Futures Reimagine Challenge. Congratulations, that's really awesome, Julian. By former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, Julian currently runs a mobile money startup and lectures on financial technology at the University of Cape Town. 
Thank you, Julian. Um, Mari Dugas is a lawyer at Cooley LLP and focuses on privacy, data protection, and cybersecurity, which are such important issues intersecting in the AI conversation. She works with clients across a wide range of industries, advising on national and international compliance regimes, data privacy best practices, risk management, and incident preparedness and response. Before joining Cooley, she served as a legal intern with the Office of a Staff Judge Advocate of the U.S. Cyber Command, where she contributed to and drafted provisions of operational and intelligence legal reviews. Among many other accomplishments, she worked in cybersecurity and election security at Harvard Kennedy School and received her JD from New York University School of Law and a BA from Wellesley College. Thank you for joining us. Harshita Nadimpali is also joining us, and Harshita serves as Senior Manager of Threats and Public Safety with Data Miner. She is also a U.S. Navy Reserve Officer, and prior to her current position, she was also a Research Fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And last but not least, we have Catherine McCarley, or KT, who is a program lead as an AI and machine learning program lead at Accenture Federal Services, specializing in modernizing government systems and processes through the development of AI and machine learning. She holds a double major in economics and Chinese with a minor in Spanish from the New College of Florida, a master's in statistics from the University of Florida, and has completed the US State Department Fulbright Fellowship in China. So thank you all for being part of this important panel. And to sort of set the stage, um, and I'll start with you, Julian, is I wanted to just get a sense of how did you find your way into the artificial intelligence space? Um, and, and, and if you can talk a little bit about, you know, adding into that, how your sort of path evolved, if it was linear or nonlinear, um, what are the sort of the different points that, that led you to where you are? And Julian, starting with you, that led you to sort of become an entrepreneur in this space as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, so I've growing up was always interested in maths. Um, I, I played a lot of puzzles and chess, problem solving and the like. Um, and then when I went to university, I studied computer science um, and initially worked as a software developer. Uh, and then right about 2016, 2017, started getting interested in emerging technology, blockchain, um, AI, machine learning and, and the like. Um, and then I went back to university to do my master's in, in financial technology. Um, so at the University of Cape Town uh, here in South Africa, on this master's in financial technology, we, we look at uh, some machine learning, we look at some blockchain and a bit of entrepreneurship as well. And, and, and pretty much I think that was the, the inflection point, if you will, where um, after spending a bit of time in corporate, I then went down this path of uh, looking at emerging technologies and innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, so it was more, I think, in the background, I'd always had an interest in, in, in maths and, and technology, um, but around about 2016, 2017, that's when uh, I, I sort of changed course from, from corporate. Uh, and that was more just, I think, um, just a matter of, of time, passing and uh, you know wanting to to learn something new. Thank you. And Harshida, how about for you? Were math and sciences also an entry point? No, not at all for me. Um, I had studied international security in college um, and I applied to work at the startup data miner that I work at as a regional analyst um, for Africa and Latin America. So I had no prior AI experience and didn't think I would end up working in AI, um, but because it is a startup, some new positions and teams open up, opened up once I joined. Um, so I joined that new team and we evolved into a group that was building a lot of the product output and innovating new features. Um, and since I had become the expert on threats and public safety content, when the AI team started building some of the models related to that content, I was their primary contact and worked with them really closely to build workable models that achieved what the clients wanted. Um, and that partnership was really successful of having AI scientists partnered with subject matter experts. Um, so after that, I started working more closely with the AI team on other model development projects as well not just you know, in the NLP space, but also computer vision models. And that's kind of what my role has now evolved into. 
Katie? Hi. So actually, um, I did not intentionally get into AIML. I was um, working more in the policy space, um, and I really wanted to do more focused on economics. So how can we solve, you know, refugee crises um, using optimization models? So it was not really AI. It was very based statistical analyses. And I thought we could solve, you know, many problems with more simple methods. And then as we started going and, you know, you have larger data sets, you need more compute power, and there's more complex variables involved. It really involved in that there are more mathy ways of solving problems. And that's sort of where I realized that I needed to improve my own math background. Um, so I actually went in for economics and policymaking, thought I could get away with some simple stats and then realized I really needed to dive further into more of that math background to really build out the systems that are required. Um, and then along the way, I realized I really needed to get more into computer science. So I started picking up skill sets for programming and that sort of all came together um, in an internship uh, that I applied for and then didn't really think I wanted. And then it ended up being exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I took that chance and I ended up doing a lot of programming, a lot of model building and applying a lot of those skills that I kind of picked up ad hoc or, you know, oh, I need that. So I went after it and got it. Um, so it was really very accidental that I ended up actually building AI. At the time I was like, I'm just gonna solve this problem. And then they're like, oh no, this is called machine learning. And this is what you're going to do with that. And there was a lot of terminology I picked up on the fly. Um, so I would say like my process of getting into AI was not very formal. I know a lot of people come in now and they're like, I did a data science program and I have a long, really strong background in this area, or I did a computer science degree. Um, and I think a lot of the experts that you'll see today didn't really do that to get in. It's the younger crowd that has that benefit of having those skills right off the start. Thank you, Mari. I also had a, a less formal way of, of getting into this space. Um, and like KT, I started in, in the policy world and found the, the issues related to, to cybersecurity and, and data privacy were, were the most interesting to me. And especially uh, when thinking about the law, that there, there are very few legal frameworks, regulatory frameworks around a lot of these emerging technologies, uh, which is fascinating to me because you have to really you have to think creatively about the way the law currently exists and uh, and understand what the technology is currently where it wants to go and and how you how you map it onto these these legal frameworks that weren't created for a lot of a lot of these technologies um, so a lot of what I do right now is is driven by the innovations that that companies are coming up with and so as I think we saw companies integrate more and more, AI and, and machine learning technologies and, and methods into their into their companies and their their products and services. Um, those were th those are the the legal questions that are top of mind for for a lot of private sector clients right now. Um, and so the the nature of our work is that we uh, and and I had to get deep in the weeds on on this technology to be able to to advise clients and understand again both what are what are the legal frameworks that we could be leaning on could could apply to to artificial intelligence um but but more than that because there are very few what do we what do we want that regulatory space to to look like and how how do companies keep that that future in mind as they're creating and developing this technology um so they're they're some of the most fascinating questions to me thank you all and I want to open this question up to everyone. Um, you know, given what I noted earlier about sort of lack of global access to internet technologies, coupled with what we know about the statistics around girls and women's engagement in STEM, so in the math and sciences, which I think is often the perception of what skills in AI must look like. And I think when I say artificial intelligence, I think that can include adjacent fields like cybersecurity. Um, and and machine learning that we're taught, you know, we're we're sort of using these concepts. So, as girls and women are thinking about this field, and if STEM or technical skill sets may not be accessible to them, what are some of the skill sets that girls um, can start to develop today that they might bring into the field? And one of the things that we always talk about at Girl Security is that girls and women 
spend their entire lives living to secure themselves and often being secured from nothing. So they're intuitively tuned into what it means to assess situations, make quick decisions, and think about physical and sort of broader societal security. And we think that's a skill set. But what are some of the sort of, and I'm putting skills in quotes, that girls and young women can start imagining in their minds, especially if they lack access to technical learning. Um, I would open that up to anybody. I'm happy to to start out with that as as someone who does not have uh, much of a technical background at all. I I think one of the the skills that's most critical in this space outside of the the technical training is communication and being able. I, I think there's such a value in in this field and as as AI continues to to grow and develop to being somebody who can converse with the folks who who are are working with the technology and with the folks who have maybe heard artificial intelligence used once and think of the movies when they think of artificial intelligence. And so being somebody working on those communication skills and understanding how do you, you know, how how can you ask the right questions to to the technical folks to understand what, what it is that they're doing, what are they thinking about, and, and distilling that to you know, perhaps the business professionals, the legal professionals, other people who are having to make uh, primarily like business risk decisions about this technology. Um, that that kind of middle middleman role, I think, is really, really important and hinges on on communication. That's great. And I think that'll be helpful for the educators who may also be interested. Julian, were you did you have some thoughts as well? Yes, uh, yes, I'll, I'll go back to, to problem solving um, and maybe, you know, like pattern recognition and the like, um, you know, to say that I, I think this, this is probably already a skill that uh, people have without realizing, you know, that this is a skill that they can transfer into, um, in, into other fields. Uh, but I think looking at how, how can we teach, uh, you know, things like problem solving, uh, I'm, I made reference to, to, to playing chess. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in in chess being one of those mechanisms that you can use to to teach, uh, you know, pattern recognition, to teach problem solving in a social setting, right? So I I, I firmly believe that you know chess and maybe other related games is is one way that you know you can start to teach some of these concepts so that there's an intuition for this uh, before it's taught in a formal sense when when opportunity arises. That's excellent. Thank you. Katie or Hashida? Yeah, I think probably the only thing I would add is that um, in like tandem with like complementary to problem solving is also like once you have that sort of problem solving ability, people come in with all sorts of different experiences, like, you know, world understandings. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed in a lot of the work that I've done is that out of the box thinking doesn't necessarily come from a lot of the technical people. Um, so you'll find that, you know, they have this problem, they have this model, and this is how they've always used that model, or they've always applied it to this type of problem. And I think in some of the spaces that, oh, my camera fell, apologies. Um, but I think in some of the spaces that we're in, um, you know, that out of the box thinking, the problems that we're looking to solve, um, for example, when it comes to, you know, optimizing um, refugee asylum applicants. You know, if you have all these applicants coming in, well, there are models that do something similar for supply logistics, but we can also apply it to people. You know, where can we best fit these people that they belong, that they will fit in, that they will have job opportunities, they have growth opportunities. And those are all variables that governments have data on, job employment numbers, uh, job open positions, uh, locations where there's a lot of housing available. And so those are all things that, we have data on that we use, but someone else who has more experience on, you know, understanding uh, migration movements or, you know, conflict analysis, they would be able to come in and say, well, why don't we try an optimization model? Like you can do it for supplies. Why can't you do it for helping people out? And I think that sort of out of the box thinking really helps. Um, I know like on the teams that I've been on, technical people say really in the weeds, they like the models, they like just working with the data that they have, but they don't have a lot of that, you know, background expertise and other policy making and other issues. And so just having that background of different backgrounds really helps to sort of broaden what you can do with what you have. 
Yeah, similar to what Katie said, I mean, because of my own background, what I've noticed is that, you know, ultimately AI is going to play some role in every industry. Um, so, you know, if you develop um, expertise in whatever area or industry that you're passionate about, and then pair that with a really strong, like fundamental understanding of how AI works and ethics and strategy behind it, um, you can really apply it to any industry and, and take that and work, work in AI. Thank you. I think that provides a great rubric for people uh, in terms of just high level skills. And I guess my next question, and it kind of builds off of what Merve was, was sharing about sort of the significant um, risks of inequality and perpetuating stereotypes. And I think related to that, what we see among young people, especially in our program, is around deep fakes and sort of that flow of dis and misinformation and sort of how that shapes their understanding of the world. Uh, building off of what Merve was talking about is in your opinions and even from your perspectives, why is it so crucial to have, I think girls and women's participation in this space and even more broadly diverse populations participating in the artificial intelligence space from the, from the entrepreneur side to the private sector side to the civil society side, why is diversity so important in this field? And especially at this moment, um, and happy to start uh, again, who would like to, to take first, first go at this, it's the big one. Julian. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I, I think I can talk about this from the entrepreneurship side of things that, um, you know, what, what we've learned in the few years of building products for for use in in low tech communities is you know there's nothing that beats being on the ground and getting the context right right so if you try and say build a product from an ivory tower um, from a distance without involving the people that you're building for you're going to get it wrong and and this is the classic thing with with uh, technology creators right um you know as is one of the panelists mentioned there's this there's this passion for creating the creating products and being in the detail and in the weeds, but often missing out on the context and the, the real life impact. And that you can only get by being on the ground, um, having that exposure or otherwise having a diverse team with, with diverse experiences. Um, and I think from, a, from an AI perspective, um, I think Merve touched on this, that you know, we'll, we, we see some of these algorithms um, and models having inbuilt bias because every one of us has some bias. Uh, and unless we actually make a conscious effort to overcome some of these biases, then um, we, we, you know, we just don't know what we don't know. And, and certainly speaking from, you know, from, from, a, from a man's perspective, um, you know, like I, I will not know what I don't know. I'll only know what I know, uh, maybe from what I've learned through media or conversations with others, but I often won't have, um, you know, firsthand experience that, that girls and women will have in, in regards to different issues, whether it's you know, being in the workplace, their careers, um, to, to managing health, reproductive health, and, and so forth. Um, and so because of that, because of that limitation that I have, it is, it is crucial that we have girls and women participating um, at, at every stage you know, of the process, whether it's you know, from you know, providing the experiences, providing the data that is relevant, um, but certainly, I think if, if if we build in a vacuum, if we build from an ivory tower, we, we're going to miss the mark always. Yeah, and it's I think what we're hearing is the implications of missing the mark are far more significant today because of these technologies than they were around other technology areas even 20 years ago now, less than that. Um, Mari, Katie, Hashida? Yeah, I think something also is that a lot of these AI models, it's not just in the building process, but also after the fact, how are they being applied? Um, it's really important to have, you know, diverse teams of women and uh, involved in this post-development and usage and implementation phase as well, um, because there, there's just more points and people that can notice any patterns of bias that a model is exhibiting, you know, after it's built as well, and can, you know, have the judgment to know maybe this is not the best use, use case for this model. Um, when it's being applied. Yeah, I can definitely add on to that. So I know on our own teams, when we've built something, we used to have a very small team, you know, a few years back, there weren't a whole lot of 
really anybody doing AI ML. It was so new. They were mostly hoarded in startups. So like in the government space, there weren't a lot of experienced people. Um, and we had a very small team. I think there were only like two to three data scientists on the team where we were actively building models and deploying them. And we found just by growing the team, by having different backgrounds, different people join the team, we had a geneticist we had who was now into programming. We had someone whose background was in foreign languages. And, you know, by having them join, they just came to the table with something a little mm -hmm. bit different. A little, And when we were building these models, it was, well, you missed that. This data is dirty. Like, you can't do that with what you have. And, oh, look at that. That's something really weird. Maybe we should try this different way of structuring the model entirely. And it was just by having more people, more different voices you catch more things. Like one person isn't gonna be able to make a perfect model. There's so many little things that you're just going to miss naturally. And even if you have a team of four to five people, you're still gonna miss stuff. And so really the goal is, is can you get as many people involved as feasible to check it on the front end, check it on the back end, when it's deployed, how is it performing? And just make sure that you know you have different people reviewing those things. It can't always be the same person. Um, you just, you miss things, it's natural. <laughs> I think that that all covers it. <laughs> that <laughs> covers the gamut. Um, well, I want to get to at least one last question, um, and I'm going to put it two ways, which is either, is there an AI role model that you could share and or are there resources aside from girl security, of course, uh, where we can offer mentoring and training on AI and related fields? Are there resources that you've seen that would be really cool either for girls and or for educators who may be working with them across communities worldwide? So I do not, I'm gonna throw out an organization that I also volunteer with, um, AI for All, it might be pretty familiar. I don't know, everybody's in this space already, um, but they specifically work with high school and college students um, and encourage people of diverse backgrounds. So it's not specifically just to women, but anyone of a diverse minority background um, and in teaching them some of these technical skills using open source technologies. Um, so if, you know, for educators out there, if you know you have students who have the ability to access, you know, computers and things like that, like they have the ability to, you know, apply to join this program um, as early as they'd like. I think one of the new programs is, um, for middle schoolers actually um, as part of there. So you can get in and start learning these skills as soon as possible. Um, and I think that really helps is even if you don't go into tech, you know, just being more technically inclined, you know, knowing about programming, knowing that what AI really is and what it is not are things that would benefit anyone in any career as we move forward. Um, and I just think it's really important for people to just be aware. And so I think AI for All is probably the organization I work with pretty often. Um, and, you know, working with students, you know, they're just, they learn so much and they retain it so fast. And I think it's just an opportunity that like all women should have, all young girls should be able to choose what they'd like to do, even if they don't really like it in the end, they can move on. Um, but I think it's kind of a, it's a good one to keep in mind. Thank you, that's awesome. Julian. Um, yeah, so two, two things. One is there is a startup here in South Africa called Fundamate. I'll, I'll post the details in the in the chat. Um, what they've built is an AI uh, exam or study buddy that's available through WhatsApp. So, you know, students that are in high school can um, basically send a message to this WhatsApp number, to this chat number, and ask questions for any subject and basically get, you know, maybe an explanation for a math problem or um, they can get access to past exam papers, but they can ask these questions using natural language, um, which is pretty cool. And I think they've also been working with educators to, to try and deliver, you know, to try and deliver these educational experiences through through WhatsApp, so through, through a chat interface. Um, so I think that's, that's like a really cool way to try and um, increase access to materials using um, using this this technology and then from a role model point of view um there's uh the cto the chief technology officer at open A ai her name is mira murati um you know so I, I think it's pretty cool that you know of course chat gpt we might have some questions about um whether they've you know they, they've taken care of bias in in, in their model models and the like um, but I think it's it's pretty encouraging to see that the chief technology officer is is female, 
which um, you know, which which is really encouraging for anybody that's wanting to get into the space and and uh, have ambition to create products, these AI products that can change the world. Very cool. Thanks for sharing those resources. I think one of my uh, AI AI role models is a good friend of mine who left uh, left working at Google a couple of years ago to start her own company, and took took some some ideas or surrounding AI and wanted to to do something good for the world, and so she created her her company. And I I find that I mean just a, in, inspiring to to see somebody like go out and figure out how to get what you want. Um, and she, to me, is somebody who kind of bridges that gap really well of understanding and being a deeply technical person and, and being able to explain, like, why does this matter to, to any given person? And why does it matter that, that people with, with different backgrounds and who come from, from minority backgrounds or who are diverse in many ways, why, why is it so important that, that we're the ones creating these companies and working with this technology? Um, so every every time I I speak with her, I, I learn something new about about AI, um, and I, I think she's also inspired me to to learn by doing. You know, a, a beauty of this space is that there's a lot of open source technologies out there, um, and it is it's it's really helpful to kind of tinker around with it and see you know what what things can actually do and, and start to get a sense of what what the bounds are, uh, and that's. It's it's a unique opportunity to to learn by doing. Very cool. I'd love to see more girls starting up solutions and getting into the entrepreneur space. That would be really really exciting. Harshita, I know you had some some resources or names maybe. Yeah. So for the classwork, I'm a big proponent of the free online courses on sites like Coursera. That's kind of how I started. Um, you know, I took like a paid course, but prior to that, you know, I really started on like LinkedIn learning. There's so many free resources online that are, you know, just fundamental courses to introduce you to AI. Um, and, you know, from there, one strategy I like to recommend to my friends is to find like the intersection of AI and whatever it is that you work in or you're interested in, you know, whether it's like AI in sports or AI in biotechnology, whatever it is. Um, and there's even, you know, so many more niche small classes online for each of these. And I think because the field is emerging, there's so many resources available online. That's terrific. Well, I know that there is a lot we didn't cover, but hopefully this provided at least an overview, some touch points and some resources and some faces as well. Um, so for folks listening uh, or watching after, please feel free, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but to reach out on LinkedIn and connect because I know that many of the folks on the panel are often posting really great information, especially for educators. Um, and so we really want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us for this panel and sharing your insights and expertise and also resources as well. And I will turn it back over to Amanda. Oops. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to everyone for being a part of this conversation. Um, I want to extend a special thanks to the International House at the University of Chicago, uh, the Center for Global Health at the University of Chicago, and the YWCA. Um, your unwavering support and assistance have been invaluable in making this event a success. Um, furthermore, I want to express my appreciation to all of you, the distinguished speakers and panelists who, dis who grace us with the profound insights. The discussion on the impact of AI on education and AI in general have been thought provoking. And we recognize the ever evolving nature of our world. And it is essential for us to equip them with the necessary skills to thrive in the digital era. So we are going to take on all the resources you have shared. And as we move forward, I sincerely hope that the connections and collaborations formed today will continue. 
um, together, we can continue hand in hand working together to make a tangible difference in the lives of women and girls around the world. Once again, thank you all for the unwavering support and your contributions. It is through collective efforts that these things can create a brighter future for the girl child. Thank you and best wishes. Uh, we will close off with a video from Girl Security. National security is the most important common cause. It includes protecting the interests and ideals that shape people's understanding of democracy from complex challenges, including emerging technology, climate change, nuclear weapons, and more. Everyone is affected by national security. Yet women, people of color, and others have remained underrepresented across national security, including government, industry, and the social sectors. In fact, the same populations underrepresented in national security today are those that have been historically disadvantaged by national security policymaking. Girl Security is working to create economic mobility for girls, women, and gender minorities interested in national security through supportive pathways. Beginning in high school, through identity-centered programming, including a cutting-edge training fellowship, a nationwide mentor network, and a growing community of pipeline partners, Girl Security is forging equity in national security by advancing girls, women, and gender minorities. In doing so, we're building a new understanding of national security that reflects the diverse lived experiences of girls and women and a workforce dedicated to protecting the interests and ideals of all of us. To learn more about our work, visit our website at girlsecurity.org.